You're listening to Drinks and a Movie with your host, Rudy. Spoiler alert. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Drinks and a Movie podcast. I've got my co-host, Carissa, with me. We're continuing our whole Halloween spooky season month. We've got a very special episode right now. As you can see, we're in the amazing studio of creature effects, special effects, uh, makeup artist, creator, Alec Gillis. Some of the craziest credits in the game, just to name a few. Aliens, Alien 3, I think Demolition Man, right? Mortal Kombat 95, yeah. uh, Tremors, Pumpkinhead, uh, Predator Prey. Smile. Smile, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. You can see it here. Alec, thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. Welcome to the uh, Monster Factory. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, incredible place. First off, I mean, I brought some some booze here if you guys want to partake. Oh. <laughs> so, Did you? Uh, yeah. I've got a few options here, a couple favorites. We've got Mescal 33, excellent um, Mescal. They're friends of the podcast. Uh, that one is very easy and light, kind of luxury brand, very um, citrus forward. So we got this one if you like that. I've got Nelson Brothers. This is from Tennessee, their reserve bourbon. Coming in at about 107 proof, I think. And their sherry cask finish, which I think is just 90 proof. Yeah. Uh, the sherry is a personal favorite of mine, so I'm actually going to start with this one. But anything sherry you want to try. Yeah, so, so bourbon, uh -huh. just um, yeah. aged a little bit in sherry barrels. Nelson Brothers. This looks like a uh, the real deal. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, man, yeah. I smell it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what if I just took a big swig? I mean, listen. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. <laughs> oh, I smell the sherry. Yeah, it's good. It gives it a nice, like, sweet kind of figgy mm -hmm. note. I dig it. And what's the other one? The reserve. Uh, yeah, it's the reserve. So same brand, but this is their. Um, oh, you love these boys. Yeah, the that's, Nelson Brothers. That's their standard bourbon. So that juice is what they mm -hmm. finish in here. So that's the base for this one. Uh huh. Uh, high rye mash bill, so a little spice. I think about six to eight years old. I want to say on that one. Now, are you uh, a believer in the whole like if you have a sip of clear, don't follow with brown or vice versa? I <laughs> kind of do. Just because I know I've gotten sick from that before. Is Maybe that just is me. that more just about your enthusiasm for alcohol than it is about mixing the the order of what you drink the alcohol? <laughs> Maybe may I'm not too sure to be honest. I should. What's the science behind that? I mean, I'm like it's all going to the same spot, right? <laughs> and I'm it's like, all your alcohol. Not yeah. like, mm. All alcohol. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. that's true. I had when we were in Prague just to keep it on. This is a good. We'll keep it both topics. Yeah. We were shooting Alien versus Predator one, and we were in in the Prague city center, which is a freaking amazing place mm -hmm. and we got absinthe because Prague is known for absinthe yeah. like real yeah, absinthe like real. well it as no real longer, as it can be they don't have wormwood in okay. it anymore okay. so yeah. it's apparently the poop of the worm okay. as it eats the, the the wood is what gives you the psychedelic so they don't have that Yeah. but we were warned that it will mess you up and, and we're like it's just alcohol yeah. right it's just it's like not. whatever the proof is right I've had Everclear and all. Yeah. so we had the whole thing sugar and flames and all that stuff and then like it was fun it was a fun night and then the following monday we're in the workshop making aliens and predators oh this is we keep it on the <laughs> yeah. topic yeah and um people were saying like wow that was a cr that was a crazy night we're like yeah blast and one of the guys said how about that dog in the restaurant and i said dog in the restaurant yeah he was next to the keyboard player keyboard player wait a minute and i had a total like me and a couple of other people were like we don't remember any of this. Yeah. And there was like a whole like uh, period of like a couple of hours, total memory lapse. And it then over time, it started coming back. And I went to the guy in the shop who, there's a, 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 a shop there, you know, that sells absinthe um, and the Czech guy there. And I said, what's the deal with this? What's he? he says, oh yes, if you drink too much, you have to go to hospital <laughs> to get your memory back. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> is it just that it's hot or is absinthe it, no wormwood? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's wild. So anyway, oh, I, but I haven't had a bad experience jumping back and forth between clear and brown. Yeah. I mean, I have before. I just, you know, obviously can't do too much, but exactly. I try to be careful. I mean, I especially know. today. I'm not trying to. I mean, Especially we could just today. get lit yeah. and run around with well, the yeah. monsters yeah. in here. You can pick up your gear tomorrow if you want. Yeah. <laughs> could I try the mezcal, please? Of course. Pass it over. This is, oh, thank you. Yes. I know. I'm yeah, so this one's fairly new in the United States. It's uh, pretty popular in Mexico, but it's only been in the U.S. for, I think, a couple years or a few years. Okay. There we go. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Yeah. You're supposed to look the person uh, in the eye yeah, when you do luck, that. Right? Is it? Yeah. Oh, it's bad luck to not. It's bad okay. luck to not. I'm bad. 
I'm a Presbyterian, so we don't look people in the eye. <laughs> oh, this is really good. I don't think we've had this oh, one before. Mm, smoky. Smoky. Super oh. smoky. Oh, that's smokier than most. Really? I, I feel like it's really light on the smoke. Really? Oh, wow, yeah. Usually when I have mezcal, I go, ooh, and then I go, I want scotch because <laughs> it's not smoky enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This feels almost smoky. Oh, enough. wow. Oh, what's it's your nice. take? Is it really I smoky like it. for you, it, too? Yeah, it's pretty smoky for me. Yeah, I was, like, I was, it lingers. I was wondering how you would feel about this one, because I know you seem to be scared about the mezcal tequila. I know. I'm, like, mm, I'm a tequila drinker. Uh -huh. okay. I'm really too much of like a mezcal okay. drinker, but this one's really nice. Yeah. That's I a like banger. It. Mm, it's good. Yeah. It's tasty. Oh, yeah. Thumbs up. All right, let's talk. Let's talk. So, beginning of your career. Oh, beginning of the career. <laughs> it all started with booze. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> No, I don't. Yeah. So I, my story is very similar to a lot of people of my age, wherein we were like growing up in an idyllic time. Right. Mm -hmm. Literally like the streetlights come home. Come come on. Yeah. The streetlights come home. I'm already. <laughs> the boo is a teacher. <laughs> They're coming down. Uh, I grew up in Orange County. Uh, yeah. I could see the Disneyland fireworks from my bedroom window, oh, wow. my, my upper bedroom window. I, I mean, my bedroom window was on the second floor. I didn't have an upper and a lower bedroom. <laughs> we were not wealthy people. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, so I got to, um, like, there was a summer where my mom would just drop me and my older brother off at the Disneyland gates. And you'd have $7 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you'd get in for whatever, 5 bucks or whatever it was. Book of tickets. Maybe it was $12. Book of the Tickets, right? Mm -hmm. Which you would burn through in about, uh, you know, an hour, riding yeah. everything until it was just the trolley ride. And then you'd, But we would just run around the park until closing. And then she'd pick us up. So she'd drop us off at like whatever, 10, and pick us up at 10 p.m. And that's, you know, that that's, was how that's it was. Childcare. And childcare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to do it. You would not leave your children yeah. uh, on a Disney Channel uh, TV show. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I got to see animatronics. I got to be exposed to robotics and characters. And and I fell in love with all that live stuff. Mm -hmm. And and just the sheer creativity of it, you know, was was not lost on me. And the art direction of the place and it's just yeah. like so awesome. And then you'd have it uh, you'd have, you know, the wonderful world of Disney on TV on Sunday yeah. nights and so there was movies and there was the theme park and all that stuff which was fantastic. And then also um the other aspect of my upbringing was my my father was a fan of um, of effects movies and mm -hmm. horror and stuff like that, and he had he was an insurance salesman, and he had sold insurance policies in the Thirty Rock building in the fifties. Uh, so uh, that's where NBC was on the East yeah. Coast in New York City, and so he met people like Dick Smith, who's the the famous yeah. guy who did The Exorcist, mm -hmm. the makeup artist, and The Godfather, and so on, and he was in Dick Smith's workshop, sold him a life insurance policy or something. Wow. Um, and so he, my dad knew something about these people who did the craft. So when I was growing up, he'd let me see these things, first of all, you know, like he'd wake me up at, you know, to watch um, a Ray Harryhausen movie. It was like the sword fighting skeletons of Jason and the Argonauts, mm -hmm. yes. you know, that sort of thing. And he would explain to me, those are only little models. And they move them one frame at a time. I don't know what he's talking about, but it was super compelling. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, and then the other thing that, that he gave me was an understanding that adult individuals make this stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen. It's not just like, you know, and it's not all about the stars yeah. of the movie. Uh, it's, and, and so I, ca I came up really thinking about the, um, the technical people and the artists behind the the what the public was seeing but there wasn't a lot of information about that stuff yeah. at that time so you really had to like dig deep or make phone calls to people and yeah you know um you know i'd get on the phone with stop motion animators and mask makers and stuff like that ask them questions and everybody was super nice you know and and very um very giving very very forthcoming with information and encouragement which which i always thought was really cool that i think that happens a lot with creative people yeah you know people in general when they discover that you're into something that's unusual like the guy at the hardware store would be like well, what are you using these things for and like well i'm trying to make a monster a what and then he'd be like on fire like hey bill this kid's making monsters you know and then they're like you know they're getting into it you know um so i've always felt like uh 
I've felt a lot of support. Not everybody felt that support though, because I, I know that you know some of my artists and artists that I know were like, you know, they grew up in um, households where people were freaked out by right. if you drew skulls yeah. and zombies and Satan. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's a hot button issue. That's yeah. my household for some people. <laughs> that's my household. Did it's you grow up in a household where they? So were? when I was younger, my dad actually I watched the Predator for the, for the Predator movie for the first time with him. My mom was very against it. And, like, I wasn't even allowed to see The Nightmare Before Christmas. Somebody gave it to me as, as a VHS. And she was like, nope, nope. That's yeah. just, like, pepping you for, like, you know, the devil's work. She's now super, super religious. So I write a lot of horror movies now, and Rudy films them. And she's like. Still not having it. <laughs> no. Not having it. Huh. Which is fine, though, because I'm like, I just, I don't know. I love this stuff so much. Does she know? has she ever gotten to a point where she can see that it is a no fiction and Hollywood is creative. not a good place. Right, she's you know it's one of those. She's got a point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. True, um, very, very true. I mean, you can always find what you're looking for, right? You can always find yeah. the worst of it and the best of it, and and I think and you attract that thing that you're that you're uh, looking for yeah. as well. Uh, and it will find you. Uh, I guess what you have to be um, aware of is, like, in general, in life, is that, like, y it's good to be open-hearted and open-minded, but also have some um, spidey sense. Yeah. Women have a spidey sense, I think. Yeah. Men have, have less of a spidey sense yeah. in, in, certain, <laughs> in certain situations. Yeah. That's, that's um, true. So all those things. Uh, mom gave you gifts you may not be aware of. Yeah. That's very true, too. Like, I mean, I will film a bunch of scary stuff in my apartment, but I'm like, we're not doing any, like, Ouija stuff. For real, for real. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Things yeah. like that. I'm like... But isn't that interesting? Because there are pockets of, like, super... Like, I go like, yeah, yeah, monsters. Yeah, whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, but there are pockets of things that you go like, oh, not oh, that. Yeah. I you know, know and, and like, like because mm. I've... And it's funny how people fall on the spectrum, right? Like, I don't really like the... Um, like, I don't really love slasher movies, um, partly because the it's easier, the work is easier, mm. right? Like, to get a reaction, yeah. pump blood all over. you kid, you put, you know, blood, fake blood and run into a room and everybody freaks out because it's that color in it, yeah. in it you're right. Um, so I don't, but it's not, I'm not super morally opposed to it or anything. Uh, I have turned down some jobs if it's like, hey, we're going to do a movie, you know, Lady Scalper 6, you know. <laughs> and then I'm like, mm. uh. not only is it not very challenging, but I just, what am I putting out in the world at that yeah, point? Yeah, right. But the areas of, like, the supernatural and those things that are embedded in yeah. our history of the three religions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, of demons and all this, you know, supernatural, yeah. uh, ancient stuff, Kind of, I get chills when I think about it because that's the stuff that the exorcist taps mm -hmm. into. And, the, like the and you kind of go like, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but I can't be sure. Yeah. yeah. Like just <laughs> yeah, in yeah. case. Ouija Everyone stuff. Like, yeah. what is a freaking Ouija board? How does that work? <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, well, like, I'm like, yeah. ah. Still yeah, don't so want to touch it. I'm yeah. still, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. So that was my. Uh, my early upbringing. Yeah. Were, were you, because, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. You, sh you were showing us um, some, like, remote controls for something you're working on. And, I mean, when you were younger, like, it sounded like you started kind of figuring this stuff out, going to the store, trying to create your own um, monsters and everything. I mean, do you have a background in any kind of, like, in robotics and engineering and all that when you were in school? To Because it just blows my mind that all you guys, it's not like you're just sculpting and making the design, yeah. but you're wiring and servo motors and controls. I mean, where did you learn that just as along the way or? Well, um, the personal journey is, you know, just being curious about every aspect of it and going like, somebody has been doing this. Why mm -hmm. can't I do it? You know, I can do this. If anybody can do it, I can do it. And you get into it and you, you get into it as far as you can go. And then as you learn, you go like, oh, I see there is a like engineering mm -hmm. and robotics sophisticated versions of that mm -hmm. are beyond me, which is where I hire geniuses. Mm -hmm. um, but I can talk to them because I understand the language. And coming up through the 80s, you had to be able to do 
all kinds of things. You had to be a jack of all trades because right. those individual uh, areas were not widely developed for movies yet. Like you had animatronics at uh, Disneyland and theme parks, yeah. but they weren't in movies until maybe Carlo Rambaldi was doing stuff in the. He was doing stuff in Italy in the late 60s with hydraulic creatures mm -hmm. and stuff like that. or or And then the King Kong movies in the 70s. And eventually E.T. Yeah. and yeah. the head of the alien for, right. for Ridley Scott. He mm -hmm. mechanized mm -hmm. that. So that guy was like ahead of the curve because he, he sort of understood more of the robotics aspect. It's now filtered down and it's more it's more available. And, and Jurassic Park, actually, my old mentor, Stan Winston, um, was the guy that sort of brought theme park people into the movie side mm. of it to create these giant sophisticated things but like when it comes to you know electrical systems and you know hydraulics pneumatics i can direct people mm -hmm. and we can have meaningful conversations um but part of my job in dealing with those uh that's the left brain right those left brain folks who design that stuff is I try to keep them from building robots and what I mean by that is they have to be performable characters that right. mm -hmm. they have to use all the cool techniques that those engineers are very excited about and are necessary but we can't make something that you can't shoot you can't this too cumbersome of a, of a package a technological package so right. I have to say things like um, sometimes I, I just for shock value to, to give them the, the you know where I'm coming from it's like you know they'll say like we'll we'll do this with a combination of aqua dynamic uh, fluid control blah 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 and I, I go <laughs> can't you just put a broomstick up it and wiggle it <laughs> and then they're like G -g -g -g, you know and, and, and so but that that was earlier in my career now i have a team of people that i i've worked with for decades and and we're all we're all seasoned in what it takes to make sophisticated stuff for movies and you have to really determine at the outset of the design uh what can this movie handle? Is this a $2 million movie with a 20 day shoot? Right. Don't mm -hmm. go showing up. You can't, first of all, you can't afford to build like a giant, you know, queen alien with 72 yeah. points yeah. of hydraulic movement and 10 right. puppeteers. There's no room for that. It has to be something else. You have mm -hmm. to do, is it a miniature? Is it a rod puppet with, you know, rod removal or some other technique? Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how I work with, uh, with the engineering aspect of it now. And, and similarly, there's technical steps now that um, people that I have who are, you know, mold shop supervisor or, or my shop, um, my workshop supervisor, those people are more familiar with the state of the art uh, materials mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So I can go like, hey, let's review like, like what's out there now that's clear and super stretchy, but very strong, you know, and then we talk about stuff and we'll get samples and we'll sit around at this table and look at little samples of stuff and go, well, how can we use this? Is there a use for it? Mm -hmm. And sort of take stock of where things are because, you know, every six months there's there's new materials and right. new players on the scene and stuff like that. Is it true that you guys use condoms on the alien? We did use condoms on the alien, and they still procreate like buddies. <laughs> you can't stop them. <laughs> did you hey. use condoms on the aliens? Yeah, that's that, that's oh. still pretty common for squibs and stuff, right? Yeah, like, that's like just standard. Yeah. Yes, condoms are great. Yeah. You, have to get the, you have to get the unlubricated ones because the lubricated you can't glue to them. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And and the the this goes back to H. R. Giger in the first mm -hmm. uh, film, and and. Uh, I, Carlo Rambaldi, got to give him, him mm. credit too. But all the the tendons were condoms stretched around the cables. They were basically oh, hiding yeah. a lot of cables and stuff. And it looks great. It's cool. It's translucent. And yeah. They really that was one of the big things about Giger's work is that he strove to get transparency and translucence mm -hmm. into creatures, which people weren't really doing at yeah. that time. But the problem with them is that they break very easily, and it's con constant maintenance on set. Uh, so they're kind of a pain. So we have switched over to different materials um, that are available now that you can control the thickness and the, the durability and yeah. you know, all that. Going into Aliens, that collaboration with Stan Winston, because we already had you know HR's design, the first movie happened, and then getting into the second one, I mean, now you guys create the Queen. So is that like purely his design? Like, hey, here it is, and now all we got to all make it? Or... 
do you guys all have kind of a part well, in how that the queen know, alien yeah. is james cameron's design oh okay he did the drawings okay he conceptualized it and when 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 we got the news that we were going to be doing that jim got um aliens we were like it was like we were scared because mm-hmm. alien is like at that time was like the still pinnacle of yeah, yeah. the yeah. combination of um horror filmmaking and production design and execution yeah and it's like the art quotient in that movie is off the charts like most ridley scott movies and cameron had done terminator and written some scripts like you know the sequel to first blood and stuff like that so clearly oh, shit. you know he was he was on the rise mm-hmm. yeah and he based on his pitch i think it was he 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 got uh he got aliens and uh and then you read the script and it's like oh my god there's like a ton there's only one alien yeah you know and now there's a ton yeah. and there's a power loader and there's a queen <laughs> alien that's 20 feet tall like that's got to fight the power it's got to yeah. fight the power loader and so we were always like you know god, we, we had a, i said like jim are you gonna get hr giger uh, involved in this to design that queen he goes nah i can do it myself like, oh no, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then uh, but uh, you know what was great about cameron was that um he could he delivered right yeah that, yeah amazing th- and that's a guy that really has the left brain right brain channels right completely open there's like a pass-through door mm-hmm. between those parts of the brain because he he can write the characters. He can do the emotional stuff, mm-hmm. and he's so techy and and he has ideas about how to use technology because he's keeping up on it. Right, yeah. right. Um, but the but the look of the queen came from Jim, mm-hmm. and then and I think Jim even drew like schematics of, mm-hmm. of her as well, like on graph paper with sizes and all that. And I was involved in the uh, miniature sculpture, okay. which led you know there was going to be the miniature sculpture and then. Following that, we would do the full scale. And I was kind of like looking at his stuff and going off the vibe of it. And he's like, how come you don't have this line in the in the running down the leg, right? <laughs> I, mean, I, like that line. I don't know. I thought it might be cooler. If, and he said, put the line in. He said, it, I didn't do this for fun. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then I put the line in and you're like, it's better. Like, yeah, like, yeah. why do I? And now I realize that that stuff's gold, right? Like, mm-hmm. when, when you work with directors, having a director with an opinion right. uh, who can say, this is what I want, is like, oh, you can move like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If, you, if you put your ego aside. Yeah. If you have to touch everything and everything has to be a fight. Right. Or if you go, these are parameters. These are the notes, the parameters. I'm here to support this person's vision. Mm-hmm grab that thing because it's hard enough and there's never enough time and there's never enough money. So you got to like grab those things that are being definitively put forward. The worst thing for a director, in my opinion, is to say, "Mm, I don't really know. I'll know it when I see it. So show me a thousand things. Yeah. And then you're like, okay. And then I have to (laughs) get on the phone with the producer and say, we need to expand the design phase and you need to fund this design phase and the design phase in my estimation, the design phase could take anywhere from three months to five months. And then they go, whoa, 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 we don't have that in our budget. And they go, okay, then we have to come up with a way with the director to get to what they're looking for faster and within your parameters. Because it's all about working within parameters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can do anything. I always say, like, well, are we building a um, are we building a Testarossa, if that's still a super hot car? I don't even know if that is anymore. Huh. Are we building, like, a supercar that's, you know, any Saudi prince would be proud to drive in? Or are we building a, uh, a you know, a BMW? It's yeah. nice and safe. It's going to get you there. What are we building? You know, so you have to kind of do And that's part of like the art of the behind the scenes art of dealing with the, the people. and Because you have to serve the story and you have to, and the director has to be comfortable with what's being built. But it's my job to sort of guide them through the parameters. So you've been in the industry for such a long time. How it was, you know, back when you first started to how it is now, now that there's so many different things possible, is it harder to work with directors or companies or try to, like, get their visions because they have so many, I guess you could say new influences because there's, I mean, the internet now. You could just see everything everywhere. So as opposed to something from... Well, it is it is increasingly difficult to do fresh stuff. Like, it used to be that you could, you know, you would, like, 
you know, be into, like I used to cut pages out of National Geographic magazine and I would like, if there was like a, a show on that was like, I've never seen a, a hippo birth. I, and you get that on, on you know, videotape and yeah. it might come up, you know, and I have all these old videotapes with labels that say, you know, like hippo birth, <laughs> you know, parasitic inflammation or you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so that you could show a director yeah. that stuff. Now you're just like sending links back and forth and right. there's tons and tons, which is great because a lot of directors take the initiative to educate themselves. Yeah. Right. And that's really cool. So I don't have to like, if I want to do something weird with, you know, strange, uh, textures or colors or translucence you can just send a link i go hey, this is what i'm thinking of for and then they that sparks a conversation if it's just words then you have to go to the trouble of you know bringing those words into photographic reality for a director via photoshop or whatever and that's time consuming and expensive so it does create a shorthand that one maybe a a I won't say a downside because I, I really enjoy the period we're in right now. It's sort of a renaissance of practical effects right yeah. now. But one thing that can be difficult is if a director uh, sort of goes off and just brings you a bunch of stuff. I want this head mm -hmm. and that. And then it, it's sort of like the way directors, composers have historically been like, oh, I hate temp tracks. Mm -hmm. Because then that director has fallen in love with that piece of music and their and mind is closed to anything else. Yeah. So you're working within somebody else's you know, style or parameter or whatever. So I, I hope that, like what I really love is when uh, a director says like, I, you know, here, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, this is as far as my thoughts have gone, but show me stuff. And then the way the way I see the design phase is it's kind of like a pyramid where at the base of the pyramid, you create a whole bunch of simple, maybe monochromatic um, mm -hmm. designs. Okay. You're thinking silhouettes, right? right? Boom, 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 tons of stuff. And you present that and then, and then you learn what the director really does not like, yeah. <laughs> which is as valuable as what they do like. Mm -hmm. And then you can whittle that base that pyramid base down to okay let's capitalize on what i learned and then and you just keep going and, and then at some point in there you graduate into like uh, i love saying here's a monochromatic either could be a pencil sketch or it could be a zbrush sculpture or whatever that's basically our design now let's move to color because color can be anything mm -hmm. but you know creative people have different ways of approaching process right um and some directors will say, I, uh, I, don't, I can't work that way. We have to do color and tandem and <coughs> shape because, because they're all, and it does sound right, mm -hmm. but to me, I go, you can apply any color to any shape, right? Yeah. And, generally speaking. Um, but if, if they want to do the color work, then I just tell them, okay, that will slow down our search for the right shapes. Uh, that's how I look at it. So, but I have to be careful not to be too dogmatic about that, um, because I think I was in my younger years. I was more like, "This fucker doesn't know how," it, you know. <laughs> and now I realize, you know, well, they're just searching. You know, they're 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 searching, and and yeah. as long as everybody's working with the within the time parameters and the money parameters, mm -hmm. then then let's do it. You know, let's let's do the exploration. I mean, the most beloved character perhaps that I've been involved with is the first Deadpool with Ryan Run with the mouth. <laughs> oh my <shot>. gosh. <laughs> that no one liked. Yeah. That's so But funny. that was the real committee what a surprise. That was a real committee <laughs> effort with a lot with an ever growing CC list of people who had to weigh in. Yeah. And I'm going like this thing shoots in 2 weeks, right? <laughs> We're up to 82 designs. Can you believe it took us 82 <laughs> designs to get to that? We're up to 82 oh designs. Gosh. I said, I, and then people stop responding. I say, we need to pull the trigger or I will not have anything on set. Mm -hmm. Do you approve this design? Nobody answers. Nobody wants to be honest. Nobody answers because they're afraid. Yeah. They don't want to be responsible. To commit. Could yeah. you They'll imagine? give you all the things they think it should be, but they, but you know, the, try this, try that. But once it comes down to anyone making a decision, they are leaderless. So I have to be that person. Yeah. And then I have to say, I am going to go with this design unless you stop me. That's literally what I say. Mm -hmm. And then they go, 
and I don't hear a peep. So I'm like, okay. move forward, right? Like, we don't even have a life cast of Ryan Reynolds. At this point, <laughs> you know? So we're going to sculpt this on a generic life cast and stick, but it's rubber, so it'll stick. Right. And yeah. stick it on. I don't know, you guys. And uh, <clears throat> so we got it in shape enough. And after they saw the dailies, then everybody, hey, great work. Here's what you need to do. Blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. Go, cool. Great. Thank you very much. We'll make all those changes and then we'll, you know. So that, but that's just the sort of like, that's the unwieldy, fear based uh, side of studio filmmaking. Yeah. That yeah. no one wants. I no mean, one wants that. Is that consistent with? I guess budgets. Like, is it typical that the bigger the budget, the more it is by committee? That pretty much. It's a, it's a greater event, and I mean, there are reasons for it that are logical. I've you know right. now that I've now that I've like been on the producing side of things, mm -hmm. and and you know I I'm sort of an insider outsider. Like okay. like I, I'm an insider in the studio system because I've worked on a lot of these things and I've been in the you know the meeting rooms and and I'm trying to do the best job I can for the franchise for the studio for the you know because mm -hmm. their goals are my goals we all want to yeah. make something great we want the public to love it you know um but i'm also an outsider in that i see the inherent um uh limitations i've had to work with those inherent limitations of the big studio thing and then the independent world gives you a a, a form of freedom from that but more restrictions in in budget, and yeah. right. I know people say, you know, you can make a great movie on a thousand dollars. Yes, if everyone <laughs> works for free, Ex yeah. Yeah. if you are willing <laughs> yeah. to subject people to endless uh, to follow your vision, and you know, you can do that. Um, but if you're like really trying to do something that is on a professional level, and you're trying to pay people and all that kind of stuff. It, it costs money, yeah. But it can cost a heck of a lot less money, and and there is freedom, which is why I love uh, independent films and why a lot of the practical stuff is making a resurgence. Sometimes that's the most fun place to to work is in those one million, two million dollar mm -hmm. movies because there aren't a lot of options and you can move fast. And it's like the eighties. Imagine in the eighties. This is what it always is. Like in the, I always think of this in the eighties before we had the options that you mentioned. Um, you would hit the ground running. It would be like, there's only one option and that's to build this stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. You're Stan Winston or Rick Baker or Rob Bottin. You have the track record. Go with God and do cool stuff, right? Work with the director. That was what the studio was doing. They'd pair you up with the director and you were really answering to the director. Um, when the money investment is so huge that people's jobs are on the line, you can, if a movie tanks, people get fired. Yeah. They are, captive of that system and they're trying to work and and, and it isn't a, it isn't a totally bad system it, it 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 creates some really great stuff you know um and 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 these franchises that i'm working on now 40 years later are proof that it can come out of it. but they did come out of a time when it was an individual filmmaker's vision yes. mm -hmm. that established this great stuff and i think that they just have a harder time when it's a you know when it's a, a committee it, it's not as pure and I don't know I'm rambling but that's the Nezcal <laughs> talk well, can, can you recall I mean what's um I guess the first or one of the first films you worked on where CGI was becoming more prevalent so you had to combine practical with that like I think of um you know Jurassic Park where they had the big animatronics the puppets but also CG Terminator yeah. 2 which I, I saw Terminator 2 at the Vista recently on 35 millimeter and good god does that movie hold up now yeah <laughs> it, it looks like that CG looks like it could have come out today you know it, it's the fluid aspect of it that's what I mean about Cameron having a handle on he knew in the abyss right that you could do cool fluid movement mm -hmm. And that's what he created an effect to suit the strength of the of the digital of the CGI. Yeah. Same thing on with the metal dude, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a genius in taking the strength of a technique and pushing it to its limits. Right. And then in combination with Stan Winston's work. Yeah. On Terminator Two, pretty unbeatable. Yeah. Uh, but what was the question? What, what was uh, your oh, my like your experience with that? Like getting a a movie gig that combined those elements. I think if I lean into this, it's just going right? to get better. Yeah. Um, well, the first movie, is, does this throw the sound off? The first movie that I, 
<laughs> Rudy's up for the audiobook. Yeah. I'm, I'm deaf now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, product placement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, the first movie that I worked on that had computer graphics in it mm -hmm. was Death Becomes Her. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think it was Alien 3. Because Alien 3, well, that, you know yeah. what? It was yeah. Alien 3. But Alien 3, the creature itself was a physical rod puppet mm -hmm. shot in slow motion, optically composited into backgrounds, old school, right? Digital or uh, optical r removal of the rods and so on. And that's why sometimes it looks kind of funky. Right. Like, and because that was after the, I mean, I guess this is pretty famous, like the dog trial oh, right the where there's the dog the that little gray hanging out and running around with the thing i know that's uh, i'm a mean i think that's my i know i think <laughs> i know it was the cutest failure <laughs> we're putting a dog in this suit and it's kind of uh you know we're snipping the phone <laughs> Did yeah. that dog like just hate getting all that stuff put on, or was it um, cool? Well, you didn't enjoy it. It's like a, it's like a whip it. Really, you're gonna yeah, hire the Don Knotts of. I don't know if that resonates with you, Don Knotts. Yeah. You're gonna hire the uh, the most methed out <laughs> animal in the right? world, just naturally, to wear this rubber suit. Okay, we're gonna give it a try. And the day, <laughs> was so the, cute, day the day that footage was shot of me, you know, fitting the the, yeah. the dog, <laughs> unexpected. We had the dog there, and the EPK crew shows up with their 16 millimeter camera. And I'm like, "What's going on?" And oh like, god! Oh, we're just to shoot what's going on. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> "Oh, oh!" So then I have to put my salesman hat on, and I'm saying things like, "I think this is going to work," and all the while I'm doing. <laughs> And then, uh, and then, of course, years later, my dear friend Richard Edlin, they're like, "That was never going to work in the in the." In the I'm I like, know. "We um, gave it a shot. It was an yeah. idea. Yeah, it was the director's idea. Right." And I say, "Why not?" Because I had worked on a movie where we did rat suits for dachshunds, mm. and it worked really well. And I thought, "Well, we did a rat suit for a dachshund." Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but uh, I guess dachshunds must be calmer or something. I don't know. That was so funny. Um, was like, but he is a cute little. He was it a cute was little, cute. cute little guy. But he didn't. He didn't really perform well. It was. Kind of, <laughs> it was kind of funny, you know. But that was the first movie oh, with the so, kind of CGI. Well, yeah. Right? Be, but but the only thing that was CGI in Alien Three was the cracking of the dome mm. uh, when the lead mm. mold and the water, the you know, all that. Apparently, uh, aliens are made out of like Pyrex or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's resistant. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um, the um, they also did some debris that was flying in the wind, like ex exterior shots, were just like black shit flying through the mm -hmm. frame, like wind pushing. That was digital, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. But everything else was practical, so it really didn't affect us. The mm -hmm. you know what was being done, but on Death Becomes Her, it did because it was like really a tight mm -hmm. interaction between our work and the digital work. Right. Yeah. And, and it was like they were really taking face replacement to new levels, and they were doing some groundbreaking stuff there. And that was before Jurassic Park came out, okay. which I'm glad of because we looked uh, pretty unique for a little window before Jurassic Park. But I remember being on the set of um, Death Becomes Her and Ken Ralston, who is a legendary um, ILM VFX supervisor, said, come here, you guys want to see something? And he plugged a pushed the VHS tape in, and it was a walk cycle of the T-Rex, just, you know, on a treadmill, mm -hmm. just the digital T-Rex, mm -hmm. and it was like the gullet was swaying and the tail was uh. rotating, and it was like, we were like, holy fuck. This when the foot would hit, it would squish out, you yeah. know? And we were like, oh, my God. He says, yeah, this is like the new thing, and this is, you know. It's incredible that all of you were on the the very beginning of that because, you know, now you've got Adobe After Effects. Like yeah. anyone who wants it on their laptop can oh, get yeah. it and do, you know, all these amazing things. But you guys were at the forefront of that. And Dean Cundy also shot Death Becomes Her, right? Yes. And I know he did the Roger Rabbit run. So yeah, that's he shot Jurassic yeah. Park. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Dean Cundy. Great guy. Super dad joke guy. <laughs> When we were we were blocking out the scene uh, on Death Becomes Her with uh, Bob Zemeckis, where she uh, they have the fight, you know, she gets hit on the head with the, the shovel and her, you know, and then she throws the uh, 
the broken handle of the of the shovel ladder and it goes right through her. Um, and it was all this big um, couch, this big sofa that was there. And he said, we're subjecting these women to sectional abuse. It was a sectional, oh, my gosh. <laughs> we like, and I thought, I will never become that. And I've totally become that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys, I mean, with that collaboration, since it was still pretty new, I mean, were those VFX people, like, all on the set with you? Like, did they have to know the ins and outs of what you guys were doing, um, I guess, physically and mechanically and vice um, versa? It was, it was more of a – you don't have to, like, really deep dive into the other person's technology. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was more like, you know, Ken Ralston was there. Zemeckis, by the way, another left-brain, right-brain genius yeah. mm-hmm. who can pull out emotion, comedy, performance, and also be a super technical, savvy guy – it was coming from him. So he would be like, I think we need a, like when she's falling down the stairs, I really want to extend it. I want to feel like the longest, st- you know, stair fall yeah. ever. And we need a moment where her neck breaks. And so how are we going to do that? And then I pitch, you know, well, here's what we can do. We can make a fake head. We can, you know, j- and then Ken Ralston goes, that's not a bad idea. We can, um, we, we can composite it. You know, we could just shoot the, a, a piece of it hitting and we can composite it into the, uh, into the stairway and you can get a moving, you know, cause Ken is always thinking about like how he knows Zemeckis loves moving cameras, mm-hmm. which makes my life difficult. Right. right. Like, yes. so, yeah. As soon as there's a break, cause like the bust only goes to here. And then, you know, if you, if you move the camera, you see a, yeah. a <laughs> um, so Ken was very good about, about blending and bringing his art and my art together. Uh, but in a scenario like that, it's like you have the director who clearly knows his stuff mm. and he's calling the shots. And then the visual effects supervisor is hierarchically above me in a film like that. And and I'm there to support and go, well, here's what we can do. Here's what I and then they'll go, hey, could you could you do a uh, could you do a, you know, a, a Meryl Streep a head to toe that walks into the frame with their head turned around? I'm like, no. <laughs> We, you know, I mean, there are some techniques that we, we played around with a, a, a gag that really didn't work, but we put a low relief face on the back of a woman's head mm-hmm. and she just walked backwards. Does this work for a wide shot? You know, cause maybe right. well, you got to yeah. try these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully that doesn't become an embarrassing meme like the dog. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any footage of that. Um, <laughs> I gotta find it. But yeah, you gotta find it. It's, I probably have it somewhere. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so you, you play around with these effects and just show them like, well, what do you think of this? And, and sometimes yes, sometimes no. Does it happen often that on set, you know, the director wants something that now you can't necessarily do because the puppeteers are the way it's built or is there enough, ex- I mean, I imagine there's extensive testing with the director and cinematographer beforehand, but how often are they like, you know what, on the day. This would be pretty cool if we could do this. Can we? Oh, all the know, time. All the time. And, and, right? and mostly we don't get extensive testing. Okay. You know, because those are, those would be in the biggest budget films. Yeah. yeah. Mostly what we get is a mad rush just to have something on set. Mm-hmm. And it, within, you know, most of the parameters of what's been discussed. And then, and I'll do videos. I'll do lots of videos. And in fact, the, our, our YouTube channel. Studio ADI's channel on the YouTube. Um, we have over 300 videos of, okay. of BTS stuff that's really important. And that's, a lot of that stuff is tests that we do to show directors. Gotcha. Um, so that sort of is the testing, bench test stuff like mm-hmm. outside. So on Alien Resurrection was probably the heyday of setting up gags, completely shooting them. We might only use water instead of actual stage blood Mm -hmm. when we pump Mm -hmm. because we don't want to stain things Mm -hmm. it's just a big mess uh but but we get less testing than than you might think and then and then this is part of the exhilarating fun of the practical work for me is that we we get on set and and somebody throws us a curveball hey what if it does this and then you it's an either automatic no right listen to this (laughs) the the, the rockets have been launched (laughs) (laughs) um uh, it's an automatic no because I, I just I know it, it can't be done. Yeah. Or I go, yeah, maybe if you're willing to it's sort of trading off, if you like lock the camera off, if you get it from this angle and this angle mm-hmm. only, um, it could work. Tremors was full of that stuff. 
Thank you for listening to the Drinks in a Movie podcast. You can now find us on Instagram at Drinks in a Movie Pod, where we'll be posting photos from all the various films that we discuss. You can also email us at Drinks in a Movie Pod at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe. And thank you for listening.